Okay, folks, we have returned. I'm going to get to go to this next case for free. Case 45. Doctor interrupted. Well, Matthew, between witches and vampires, Grim Chapel is shaping out to be the strangest place we've investigated thus far. Not to mention the devious devil lurking in the background, making murders look like supernatural events. We know this devil helped Annabelle Lee disguise Edgar Woe's murder as a vampire attack. And also that they helped Larry Rochester dispose of the deputy mayor in similar fashion. The devil needs to be stopped, and their association with the Rochesters is, is particularly concerning. What crimes have they gotten away with in the past? As of now, the only lead we have on the Rochesters' activities in Grim Chapel is that a member of their family is locked up in the Gryphon Sanctuary Mental Asylum. Asylum. I agree, Matthew. This sounds like another secret for us to dig into. We better go to the asylum and see this Rochester for ourselves. You know, Geico, they help you save money on your homeowner's insurance, too. Great. Geico can help insure a mountain to LA. How long have we been signing this law? Um, 114 years. Oh, good. You're here, officers. Why? Why? Were you expecting our visit? And who might you be? I'm the director of this institution, of course, and I've called for help because one of our doctors was killed in his office. What? One of your doctors killed? Yes, and now that you're here, I urgently need to go lock up the patients and reassure the rest of my staff. I'll let you deal with it. Well, Matthew, let's head to the crime scene at once. First star already. Matthew, it looks like the doctor was murdered on his own examination bed. And you're right, he looks vaguely familiar. Good memory. That's Dr. Irving Blackmore. When we last saw him, he was a physician in Sinner's End. It seems he left his job at the Moulin Rose for a post here at Gryphon Sanctuary, but to no good end. Between the burn marks on his temples and his hair standing on end, it looks like he was electrocuted to death. Good point. The marks look like electrical burns. And indeed, there was an electroshock therapy helmet next to the body. This means the victim was killed with his own electroshock therapy machine. Taking a sample of that stain on the machine's helmet might lead us to the killer. And this must be the victim's bag. Excellent idea. Let's search it for clues. Matthew, we came to Gryphon Sanctuary in search of information about the devil, but that will have to wait until we've solved this murder. Gotta love it when we get the mur- get the cost. Gotta love it when we get the cause of death immediately. start the autopsy now, and I'm going to get some stars. Sit tight, folks. Okay, folks, we have returned. I have seven stars. I know I'm a little pressed for time here, so I'm going to get the helmet first. Oh, yeah. Eight. 
Peach. Matthew, the substitute collector from the Electroshock Helmet is bound to give us the lead on the killer. Let's get it to Viola. Three hours. Now let's unlock the next crime scene. Look at this. There's a nine. Medicine bottle. Matthew found a medicine bottle in Dr. Blackmore's bag, but the label is worn away. If you if you can recover the text on it, it might point us to a new suspect. Prescribed to Alice Riddell. Matthew, apparently our victim prescribed this medicine to one Alice Riddell. Since Alice is Dr. Blackmore's patient, let's see what she can tell us about him. Twelve years old. Don't think she has it in her to kill anybody. Hello, are you here to invite me to a tea party? No, not quite. I wasn't aware a Gryphon Sanctuary patients could be so young. My parents went away to into the went to the sky a year ago, but my animal friends kept me company, and then the doctor said I should come to live here. Miss Riddell, we know you knew Dr. Blackmore. He was hurt in his office today. Yes, I heard. Maybe it was the giant caterpillar who chewed him up. I had warned him. That the giant caterpillar is kind, really, if you make friends with it. But I even get along well with the grizzle chomp and the snooze mouse. Uh, right. But what can you tell us about Dr. Blackmore? Dr. Blackmore was a bit dull, but he took us out to the garden every day, so that was nice. The garden, you say? I agree. Matthew, that should be the next place we should look. Okay. Let's go for the first star again. Ah, I think I see a clue already. Okay. Matthew, this garden feels like a bright spot in an otherwise dark and oppressive place. Anyway, I agree. The investigation continues. We should unlock this notebook and put this torn paper back together. Alright. Oh man. TQ4. This notebook contains notes on our victim. The notes appear to be an employee review of Dr. Blackmore. 
It says here that Dr. Blackmore was uncooperative and obstinate when given orders. These notes are signed by the asylum director. I agree, Matthew. We should have a proper word with Mr. Stravinsky. Shame this guy's not related to Igor Stravinsky. Of course, I know this is just a game, but just a little humor in there never hurts. But let's see what uh, he has to say. Mr. Stravinsky, we found your notes on Dr. Blackmore. You seem to have a poor opinion of him. No, you misunderstand. I had to give constructive criticism, but Dr. Blackmore was one of my better recruits. Blackmore agreed with me that our policies here are too lax, and now, tragically, he has suffered for it. If it weren't for pesky regulations, I had the patients permanently restrained and sedated, and they would receive their nourishment through feeding tubes. That sounds barbaric. I say it would offer extra protection for staff and give patients a calm atmosphere to heal their psychic wounds. Well, Mr. Stravinsky, we don't agree with your idea of a calm atmosphere. Let us know if you think of anything else that could help our investigation. And I got a torn paper to examine before I call it a night. Matthew, this origami cat you repaired bears a message signed by Patricia Rochester. This must be the Rochester who is a patient here at Gryphon Sanctuary, and her message says, help me. Do you think she's in danger? Let's talk to Mrs. Rochester right away. Pelagic currents are strong today. They have brought me guests, and a lifesaver, perhaps. Mrs. Rochester, we found this message you wrote. You were asking for help? We are all drowning here. Castaways caught in life's undertow. The patients cling to each other and weigh each other down. I await them in the depths, Neptune's benevolent queen, but I, too, long for freedom. Uh, okay. Well, Senior Trooper Matthew and I are actually investigating the murder of Dr. Blackmore. Can you tell us... Oh, I don't bother to learn the doctor's names. They are just a blurred mass of lost souls swarming through this underworld like so many tuna in white coats. But you, Senior Trooper Matthew, I like you. Come and see me again. We'll have truffles together. Just don't tell the doctors. Well, Matthew, I can't say talking to Mrs. Rochester was particularly useful. And whatever we hope to find out about the Rochester dealings in Grim Chapel, she's unlikely to tell us. That'll do. I'll see you guys when these two are finished. See you all <clears throat> okay, folks, we have returned, and let's get the results of the victim's body right now. Matthew, did you know that electroshock therapy is used to induce a seizure in the patient? And they say when it's done correctly, it can actually have beneficial results. Wonderful, Dick. But what can you tell us about our electroshocked victim? Well, judging by the state of his body, he was led to the machine for a very long time and exposed to dangerously high voltage. Under such circumstances, the electricity causes tissue damage in the brain, effectively frying it. Dr. Blackmore also bit his own tongue in the process, which accounts for the blood on his mouth. The killer left smudges of plant fertilizer on the victim's wrists, presumably from holding him down. This tells me that your killer gardens. Matthew, I'm confident, will catch his killer green-thumbed and red-handed.
Hello, Viola. And what can you tell us about the sample Matthew took from the electroshock helmet used to kill our victim? Most of the sample was conducted with gel using electroshock therapy procedures. But the other substance in the sample didn't belong there. Mushroom sauce. That doesn't seem like a standard item for a laboratory. Indeed. Your killer must have transferred the mushroom sauce onto the helmet when putting it on, putting it on the victim. So this is definite proof that your killer eats mushrooms. Indeed, Matthew, from this evidence, it's obvious our killer has loose morals. Matthew, I'm afraid this case will eventually drive me bonkers. Let's recollect ourselves. We came here hoping a mystery Rochester locked up in the asylum would shed light on the family's activities in Grim Chapel. But instead we found Dr. Blackmore killed with his own electroshock therapy machine. We already knew of his pro proclivities for extreme medical practices, and according to the asylum director, he continued that trend here. Could one of his patients have snapped and killed him? Meanwhile, we did find Patricia Rochester, but she turned out to be most unreliable, and we're still unsure of where she fits into the Rochester family tree. Hello again, Senior Trooper Matthew. I came to tell you a very important secret. Yes, Miss Riddell, what is it? I know someone who saw Dr. Blackmore get hurt. Ooh, didn't give me the... Extra. It didn't give me the OJ. But we'll see you guys for Chapter 2. Okay, folks, we have returned, and let's start Chapter 2 of Doctor Interrupted. You do? We must talk to them. Who is it? My rabbit. He says Dr. Blackmore was eaten by the Grizzle Chomp, and now the Grizzle Chomp is hiding in the kitchen. Ah, I see. Thank you for this information. You've been a big help. Mind you, Matthew, the kitchen does sound like a good place to continue our search. Let's go. So unfortunately, I do not get the uh, extra. So unfortunately, I don't get the OJ, but that's okay. Thought that was a quotation file. Corn. File of dishes. Here we are. I do get the first star. Cool. Okay. Matthew, that's a photograph of our victim. But who is that nurse he's sharing a laugh with? Let's look her up in the database. And this clipboard appears to have information on one of Dr. Blackmore's patients, but all the writing is faded. We ought to recover it. And if you think we must root for that rancid pile of dishes, we may as well get to it. Are. 
nine. Sylvia May. Matthew, the woman in this photo with the victim is a Gryphon Sanctuary nurse named Sylvia May. Given they were photographed together, it seems Nurse May and Dr. Blackmore were close. Let us talk to her. Mrs. May, we're with the Concordian Flying Squad investigating the murder of Dr. Irving Blackmore. Yes, it's a tragedy that he's dead. One assumes that, given how much darkness we see here at the asylum, we're prepared for anything, but the death of a colleague comes as quite a shock. We found a photograph of the two of you. It seems you were close. Not especially. I don't think Dr. Blackmore was close with anyone, but you don't make it in a place like Gryphon Sanctuary without a little cam camaraderie. We didn't always see eye to eye on patient treatment. He could be quite firm, but he did what had to be done. I'm sorry, but the gardening group is starting soon, so I must be off. Please let me know if, there, if I can be of any more help. texture recovered on this file describes a patient named Dwayne Reed. Let's see what Mr. Reed can tell us about his doctor. Well, I may not get the OJ here, but... At least I can share some coins. And I better make sure that I do get all these. Mr. Reed, we're here to investigate the murder of Dr. Blackmore. We understand you're a patient of his. He's dead? That's terrible news. If it wasn't for the doctor, I'd still be hearing the voices in my head. I'm doing much better now. It's only a matter of time before I can go home, but I admit I'll be sad to leave. You'll be sad to leave? I'm in the gardening group here at the asylum, which is very peaceful. And they make me lots of mushrooms to eat, which are my favorite food. Too bad about the doctor, though. Won't be the same here without him. And I will have some more stars ready to go by the time the next analysis is over with. Matthew, I hope you didn't search for those disgusting dishes for nothing. You think that mug looks familiar? You're right. We've seen Dr. Blackmore with it before. This mug belongs to him. And the mug appears to have a coded message written on it. Let's see if Evie can decode it for us. I'll see you guys when this is done in 12 hours. Yes, 12 hours, and I'll see you all for that. Thanks for watching. Okay, folks, we have returned. Let's get the results of the victim's mug. Hello, Abby. Were you able to decode the message Matthew found on the victim's mug? It took some figuring, but I got it. The message reads, Shock therapy for, doc for you, Dr. B. Shock therapy? You're right, Matthew. Given that the victim died of electric shock, there's no doubt the message was written by our killer. And then they hid the mug among the dirty dishes, hoping the evidence would be washed away. How did you crack the code, Evie? The code is a chessboard cipher. The author assigned each letter of the alphabet to a square on the chessboard and used the coordinates to spell out the message. Your killer must play chess if they thought to write a coded message this way. 
Matthew, we just need a bit more evidence to checkmate our killer. Matthew, talking to Evie about the chess-coded message reminded me of the chessboard pattern in the Asylum Garden. It would probably be a good idea to search the garden again for clues, in case we missed anything. happy hour for the next 45 minutes, it seems. 46, actually. Okay. Jacket. strange shape this garment is. Oh, you're right, it's a straight jacket. It's useful to patient's arms cross against their body in case they are violent. It seems this straight jacket was checked out by Dr. Blackmore for use on someone, but the tag doesn't specify who. There are shavings of something all over it. Perhaps examining them will lead us to whoever wore the straight jacket. And what are those clay pieces you found? They appear to be a broken sculpture. Let's put it back together. Matthew, this sculpture is really disturbing. And this carved part says, the doctor. This is referring to Dr. Blackmore. Good point. It's likely that whoever sculpted it is probably a patient of the, of the asylum. Perhaps Diego can analyze the sculpture and tell us who made it. Let's get it to him. speed it up later, but we'll see. Almost forgot the, almost forgot the straight jacket. There we go. Brown shavings. Excellent. If we put the shavings from the straight jacket under the microscope, we might learn who, whom our victim used it on. There we go. Truffle shavings. 
Matthew, the shavings you collected from the straight jacket are truffles. Oh, good memory. Patricia Rochester did mention eating truffles when we spoke with her earlier. This means Patricia Rochester was the one Dr. Blackmore restrained with the straight jacket. But why? Was she violent towards him? Let's have, let us have another word with Mrs. Rochester. Mrs. Rochester, when, we la when last we spoke, you didn't recall Dr. Blackmore, but surely you remember the doctor who used his straitjacket on you? Yes, that scoundrel. He condemned me to the thing as punishment. Punishment for what? The doctor feared my knowledge. I have eyes everywhere here. So he bound my hands and cast me into a solitary cell. I spent hours playing mental chess games against myself, all of which I won, of course. I'm that good. He forbade me from participating in gardening, so I planted seeds of thought and watched their vines creep across the surface of my mind, clinging like ivy to a parapet. And I ask you, for whom did the doctor take himself to restrain Neptune's queen? His death is fitting punishment for him. Okay. Well, I'm going to get the remaining stars. I might speed this up later, but we'll see. For now, this is Matthew. See you. Okay, folks, we have come back, and let's get the results of the clay sculpture from Diego. Matthew, I have to say, this sculpture of your victim is one of the ghastliest things you've sent me thus far. Well, were you able to glean any information from it? Yes. For example, Matthew, the strokes in the clay weren't made with a tool, but with slender fingers, most likely female. The expression is one of bewilderment and fright. The hands are raised, as if reaching to cover the eyes, an effort halted by utter surprise. There is a naivete to this surprise, as if reacting to an atrocity the likes of which this person has never seen. The sculptor is young, a child even. Oh no! It must have been Alice who made this frightening likeness of Dr. Blackmore. Thank you, Diego. Matthew, we must speak with Alice straight away. Miss Riddell, we found the sculpture you made of Dr. Blackmore and... Oh, I made that when I was mad at Dr. Blackmore. Why were you mad at him? Because Dr. Blackmore said my animal friends weren't real. My rabbit, the giant caterpillar, the grizzled chomp. All fake, he said. But they are real. They talk to me, laugh and play with me, share their mushrooms with me and everything. They are real. I think maybe Dr. Blackmore is the one who isn't real. He's gone now, isn't he? Serves him right. Well, Matthew, the plot thickens at Gryphon Sanctuary. Dr. Blackmore was electroshocked to death, and our suspects include patients and staff alike. We've met a couple of people who attest to good things arising from Dr. Blackmore's presence at the asylum and we've discovered deep resentments harbored against him by some patients for what they felt was harsh treatment. It's going to take some doing to get to the bottom. Oh, the phone is ringing. How exciting. It rarely happens. Hello, you've reached the Concordian Flying Squad. Hello, Maddie. Matthew. Hello, Maddie. Matthew. Oh, thank God. Dick, where are you calling from? I'm at Gryphon Sanctuary. They mistook me for a patient and they won't let me leave. Uh oh. We'll have to stop them in chapter three. See y'all then. Okay, we have returned now and we'll start chapter three now of Doctor Interrupted. What? Dick, hold on, we're on our way. Oh, thank God. Matthew, tell these people who I am. Of course, Dick, don't worry. We'll get you out of there. Senior Trooper Matthew, you attest to knowing this Richard Wells? Yes, he's our colleague, and we demand his immediate release. 
He was caught with a handful of pills taken from the doctor's supply cabinet. I assumed he was a patient. What sane person would commit such a brash act? This does sound like something Dick might do. Matthew, I was merely testing the balance of concentration between their sedatives and their stimulants. The samples I tried were of excellent quality. I've only known a few heart palpitations, and my hands are shaking just a little more than... Dick, ask a nurse to take that straight jacket off you and go back to the airship, please. I'll let you go, but next time I won't be so lenient. I'm still in charge here, despite what, they, what that Fink Dr. Blackmore believed. Dr. Blackmore? Fink? Mr. Stravinsky, we'll need to ask you a few follow-up questions. Mr. Stravinsky, you told us Dr. Blackmore was one of your better employees, but you clearly harbor resentment against him. I never should have run my blasted tongue off when you were near Senior Trooper Matthew. But if you must know, Dr. Blackmore got ambitions above his station. He continually questioned my decisions and undermined my authority in petty ways. He stole the mushrooms from the kitchen knowing I loved them. He also trampled a flower bed I had just planted the day before. He said he would take over one day. Just imagine this insignificant speck who couldn't even beat me at chess, thought he would overtake me. I told Blackmore he would only be director of Gryphon's sanctuary over my dead body, and he said he'd make sure I kept that promise. So there were murder threats between you? I hope he didn't act on them. I didn't murder the scoundrel, but now he's in no place to challenge anyone's authority. Who's on top now? Mr. Stravinsky, I suggest you calm down, or you'll be needing a straitjacket yourself. Well, he's in the running now. What an awful man. It's hard to believe he's in charge of people's well-being. You're right, Matthew. Let's stay focused. We should return to the crime scene and see what else we can find. a clue already. Tin foil hat. Still got the first star. Matthew, I know what this foil hat is for. Charlie's told me it's all nonsense, of course, but the theory is that this sort of hat protects your thoughts from external interferences like telepathy and radio waves. Well, clearly someone else here believes it would help them. Does someone use this hat to prevent Dr. Blackmore from meddling with their brain? You're right. Taking a sample of that residue on the hat could tell us who it is. Could tell us whose it is. And what do you suppose these wooden pieces are? Let's reassemble them quick. Matthew, hopefully this sample you collected from the tinfoil hat will tell us who try to protect themselves from Dr. Blackmore. Let's get the sample to Viola for testing without delay.
Got the nine. Beware of female hysteria. Those pieces you found were all poster warning about female hysteria. Hysteria is some nonsense about some about women's wombs traveling through their bodies, making them dangerous and irrational, isn't it? We better see what else is written on this poster, and whether it was the victim who left it here. I'll let you retrieve the writing. Matthew, the markings on the poster are a message. Dr. Blackmore, stay away from women. It's signed by Sylvia, the nurse we met. It seems Nurse May clashed with our victim's attitude toward women. Let's see what she's got to say. Hey, look, 160,160. That's going to change pretty soon because I do have to get the rest of the stars. Mrs. May, your message to Dr. Blackmore to stay away from women told us you and he had a more acrimonious relationship than you first led us to believe. Oh dear, I knew I should have said something earlier. To begin with, Dr. Blackmore was the one who made that awful poster. You could say his opinion of women was problematic. As colleagues, we were forced to cooperate, but he was especially aggressive with the women here at the asylum, and I wouldn't stand for that. Once, I saw Dr. Blackmore yelling at a female patient, and he wouldn't stop. I told him that when I'm frustrated, I focus on a game of chess, a calming activity. In response, the doctor hit me and threatened to lock me in a cell. I don't wish anyone dead, but in his case, it's easy to say good riddance. I understand your frustration, Mrs. May, but I hope murder wasn't your answer to his behavior. It's not so far. She's only fit two criteria so far. I'll let the clear substance run its course, and I'll see you for that. Okay, folks, we have come back, and let's get the results of the clear substance right now. Matthew, I still can't believe Horatio Rochester is my biological father. And he's such a kind man. He's been so welcoming. Kind and welcoming are not words I associate with Horatio Rochester, Viola. Horatio Rochester. Viola, has he introduced you to anyone else in the family? Not yet. He said they'll have to get used to the idea. But I'm sure that's soon to follow. We can start slow. I'll bet Horatio is as surprised and nervous about this whole thing as I am. If you say so. Anyway, what have you got on the sample from the tinfoil hat Matthew found? The sample contains sweat and testing revealed that the sweat came from a dark-skinned male. That must mean the hat from which the sample was taken was was taken belonged to Mr. Reed. So Mr. Reed was the one using this hat to avoid the doctor's treatments. Let's go talk to him. Mr. Reed, we found this tinfoil hat and we... Thank you for returning my hat to me, Senior Trooper Matthew. Dr. Blackmore confiscated it when he found it. I made it for protection. Protection against what? Protection against him. Ever since I got here, the doctor's been trying to steal my mind. But you had us but you had told us the treatment was working, and you said you liked the doctor. I only said that because they were listening, and I didn't have my hat. We were playing a tricky game of chess. Dr. Blackmore and me. I couldn't stalemate him forever. It's only by my cunning that I managed to avoid his lobotomy blade. He wanted my brain, you see. Would stop at nothing to get it. I can only hope I'm safe now that he's gone. It seems, Matthew, that some of our suspects' views on Dr. Blackmore differ from when we first questioned them. I was surprised to hear he abused Mrs. May. 
I can see her standing up for herself, but murder? I can't be sure. The asylum director had his control threatened by Dr. Blackmore. And it seems Mr. Reed was afraid of Dr. Blackmore performing a lobotomy on him. Who knows if they were simply delusional fears or if it was a genuine threat. We are so close to catching Dr. Blackmore's killer, Matthew, but something still eludes us. That's an excellent point. We know the murderer's been to the kitchen. Let's do another sweep. First star, then. Where the hell is the salt and pepper? Oh boy. Oh man, I am not gonna get this. Oh, it's right on the floor. I was thinking it was on the table. Matthew, that's Dr. Blackmore's name tag, and it's covered in blood. You're, you're right. It's possible our killer dropped the name tag here after the murder. Getting a sample of these bloody fibers caught in the tag's clasp will bring us closer to catching our killer. And if you want to unlock this bread box, do go ahead. Excellent, Matthew. Now let's get these bloody fibers you collected from the victim's name tag to Viola, right quick. Nine hours. I five four five four. Four five five four nine. Nine four five four two. Matthew, you got the bread box open, and inside was a bottle of conductive gel. As the label stipulates, conductive gel is used in electroshock therapy, but what's it doing in the kitchen? You're right, Matthew. The killer must have hidden it here after killing Dr. Blackmore with the electroshock machine. Let's send this bottle to the lab. Time is ticking and we've got a murderer to catch. And I'll see you all when these two are finished. Catch you later. 
Okay, folks, we have returned. Let's get the results of the bloody fibers. Viola, what have you discovered by testing the bloody fibers from the victim's name tag? Well, as Matthew surmised, the blood on the fibers is the victim's. However, cleaning some of the blood from the fibers revealed that their original color is blue. Your victim wasn't wearing any blue, which means your killer is wearing blue. Indeed, Matthew, our killer will be as blue as their clothes when we, find, when we finally catch them. Conductive gel. Well, Matthew, the bottle of conductive gel you sent me was conducive to learning more about your killer. Great, do tell us, Viola. As you guessed, as you guessed, this bottle contains the very gel used on the victim. But on the outside of the bottle, I found traces of a salve used for treating itchy rashes. Your victim had no skin irritation of any kind, which means your killer is the one who has a rash, and they left the salve on the bottle during the murder. Well, it appears our killer's rashness just provided us another clue. They're not getting away from us now, Matthew. Matthew, we have enough evidence to catch Dr. Blackmore's killer. Let's make the arrest. Okay, it's definitely not the girl, not the young girl. Oh, and it's not the asylum director. It's not Patricia Rochester. It isn't Sylvia May. So that leaves Dwayne Reed. Dwayne Reed, we know you murdered Dr. Blackmore. Being an asylum patient likely means you can't fully answer for your actions, but we must take you into custody. Did you say I did the murder? Me? Do you not remember? We know you used the doctor's electroshock machine against him. We found mushroom sauce on the electroshock helmet you used, and we know mushrooms are your favorite food. Mushrooms are squishy and delicious, but they don't make me a killer. We also found your rash cream on the bottle of electroshock gel you used on Dr. Blackmore when you killed him. Maybe it was someone else's rash cream. Lots of us here have skin problems. Mr. Reed, do you truly not recall writing a threat in chest code on Dr. Blackmore's coffee mug? Did you kill him because you were afraid he would lobotomize you? Not me, Alice. Well, now you know. I killed him, but I couldn't let him hurt that little girl. Dr. Blackmore wanted to lobotomize Alice? Yes, he was going to cut out her brain. I heard him tell a nurse he wanted to. Alice is just a little girl. You don't do that to a child. He could have my brain if he really wanted, but not hers. I knew I had to kill him. It was the only way to protect Alice from that monster. So when the doctor called me to his office for an electroshock session, I lunged at him, forced him into that machine, and set it as high as it could go. Mr. Reed, this is a sorry situation indeed, but I'm afraid we still need to take you into custody. It's an unusual circumstance to have a mental asylum patient as a defendant. I confess I don't entirely know how to proceed. I understand Mr. Reese stands accused of murdering Dr. Irving Blackmore. Oh, I killed him all right, Your Honor, but I had to. He was going to steal the mind of a child. Yes, the doctor's papers confirmed your statement. Lobotomy is already contentious, but to perform it on a 12-year-old is heartless and barbaric. One hopes Dr. Blackmore was the only doctor with such inclinations at the asylum, but I shall have to look into it. That said, Mr. Reed, nobody can escape the law. Forensic psychiatrists will determine if you are responsible for your actions and administer a regimen of therapy. As long as I can keep my brain, I'm okay with that. Senior Trooper Matthew, I am absolutely appalled at the treatment of patients at Gryphon Sanctuary. To hear that we're going to lobotomize a child is unthinkable.
And in this case, the threat of losing one's mind resulted in the loss of a life and the loss of freedom. Senior Trooper Matthew, we cannot leave things as they are. At the very least, we must rescue the child from that place. I am counting on you. Alice or Delaclair from the start. Gregory Stravinsky, no blue on. Patricia Rochester, no rash. Sylvia May cleared early. It was Dwayne Reed. I'll see you guys for Lost Souls 3-6. Okay, folks, let's start Lost Souls 3-6, the additional investigation. Matthew, I commend you on another murder solved. I have to wonder, though, what kind of regulations do they have at Gryphon Sanctuary that allow a patient to murder a doctor? Chief Wright, the asylum's regulations are more skewed than you could ever imagine. The patients are severely mistreated. A 12-year-old girl is facing imminent lobotomy. We must have a word with the director at this institution. And if nothing else, we must save that child. Excellent idea, Judge Lawson. And this will work wonders in the mayor's eyes for your candidature to be deputy mayor. I'm doing it for justice, not publicity. Justice, of course. I cite positive publicity merely as a convenient side benefit. Speaking of rumors and reputations, Matthew, we still must look into the so-called devil who's been helping people who's helping people disguise murders as supernatural events. We tried to lure the devil out after they helped Annabelle Lee conceal her crime at a, as a vampire attack, but the miscreant only taunted us. We also know that they helped that they helped at least one Rochester commit a murder but we don't know if any other family members are involved. I'm not sure it's worth questioning Patricia Rochester, but at the moment we don't have any other leads. We don't even know how she fits into the family tree. Actually, Matthew, I can tell you that, that while this Patricia seems very hush-hush, I did convince a source to tell me about her. And I discovered she is Horatio Rochester's estranged wife. Patricia is married to Horatio? Dash my wig, Matthew. That family is a fount of secrets. As a member of the Rochester family, Patricia may be able to tell us something about their alleged deal with the devil. Even if she's clearly deranged, it's worth trying. Matthew, before you go confront Gregory Stravinsky with Judge Lawson, let's see if Mrs. Rochester can give us any information. Do it then. Mrs. Rochester, when you were still living with your husband, did you hear her talk about the devil? We understand that some Rochesters have used the services of this person to commit crimes. The devil? Evil stirring in the dark? In the furthest corner of my mind, I can see something related to this, looming and scratching at the window, but it's very hazy. The doctor told me I shouldn't think about such devilish things, so I sent it outside and ignored its knocking. You told Dr. Blackmore about the devil? Then there will surely be notes or recordings from the conversation. Mrs. Rochester, thank you for your time. Senior Trooper Matthew and I will check the doctor's office. I don't think I've even looked for that yet. There it is. And butterfly. Boom. Got it.
Wow, Matthew, they're moving Dr. Blackmore's things out already. It appears his boss is all that remains of his records here. Let's dig through its contents to see if we can find anything about Patricia Rochester's sessions. like a paint can. Some audio cylinder. Matthew, that thing under all these ink blot test cards seems to be an audio cylinder. Charlie has similar ones at home. And written on the sleeve of this one is Rochester, Session 2. This must be a recording of Mrs. Rochester. Let's get this audio cylinder to Charlie and see if he can listen to it. Alright. All wrongdoing in Gryphon Mansion. Mr. Stravinsky, I am absolutely horrified by the medical practices at this institution. Lobotomies on patients, on children, it beggars belief. Are you a trained professional? Who are you to disapprove? I'm Judge Justin Lawson, and I have a high mind to take you to court. Surely there's no need for that. I vow to you we abide by all regulations. Dr. Blackmore was the only doctor with such radical methods. From what I understand, you didn't exactly try to curb his excesses. Perhaps not, but even if I felt you went too far in trying to lobotomize that little girl, if you want to remove her from the facility, I shan't stand in your way. I should hope not, and you had better make sure that I hear no complaints about this institution in the future. Senior Trooper Matthew, I heard you'll be taking Alice Riddell away from the asylum. I'm glad to hear it. Alice was admitted here after her parents died a year ago, and the trauma made her retreat into a world of make-believe. However, in my opinion, being here only exacerbated her situation. All she really needs is a loving home. Mrs. May, does Alice have any possible candidates for guardianship in Concordia? There was a gift that arrived for Alice recently, and I believe it was from a relative, but I'm not sure who. I think she left it in the kitchen. Maybe taking a look at it would help you find her family. An excellent suggestion. Senior Trooper Matthew, let's go to the kitchen. box. There we go. There it is. Senior Trooper Matthew, you think this music box is Alice's gift that Nurse May mentioned? Well, I'm not the detective. You are, so I won't argue. If you can get the music box open, perhaps you will know for sure. Perfect. 
Senior Trooper Matthew, there's a message inside this bo music box. It says, Alice, I love you. And it's signed from Lorena. This really is the gift for Alice you were looking for. Perhaps Miss Holloway can help us discover who this Lorena is. I'll see you guys when this is done. See y'all then. Okay, folks, we are back. Let's see if I can get this over with. Let's get the results of Alice's gift. Hello, Miss Holloway. Were you able to find the mysterious Lorena who gave Alice that music box? Yes, Lorena Riddell is Alice's grandmother. Fantastic. Does she live in Concordia? Yes, and I took the liberty of inviting her here. Matthew, meet Lorena Riddell. Delighted to make your acquaintance, Miss Riddell. Does this mean you're willing to take Alice in? Of course. I've been fighting for custody since I found out where Alice was being kept. I was living abroad when her parents died. By the time I heard the news, the doctors had taken Alice and they refused to let me see her. I'm so glad to be reuniting with my granddaughter. Splendid. Senior Trooper Matthew, let's go get Alice. Reunite Alice. Alice, we have a surprise for you. A surprise? Senior Trooper Matthew, I love surprises. Oh, my dear sweet Alice, it's, it has been so long. Grandma, have you come for the tea party? No, I've come to take you to a much better tea party. One where you'll be safe and sound with me. Senior Trooper Matthew, thank you for reuniting me with my granddaughter. And Judge Lawson, I heard you submitted your candidature for Deputy Mayor. I hope you get it. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Riddell. That's very kind. And here, Senior Trooper Matthew, this is for you, for everything you've done for me. Audio cylinder. Hey, Charlie, were you able to listen to that audio recording of Mrs. Rochester's therapy session? I did, but none of what Mrs. Rochester said made any sense. For example, she says, Neptune allied with the Horned One to make Atlantis the Tenth Circle. Thus Atlantis freezes, and all of us float no more, for we are suspended in hell. So I called on Diego, hoping he could figure out what she's talking about. Alright Diego, did you have better luck interpreting the recording? I did. Mrs. Rochester is mixing references like a bootlegger drunk on her own swill, but with luck, I was able to parse them out. She calls herself Neptune's queen, which means Neptune is surely her husband Horatio. The horned one of whom she speaks is certainly the devil, especially considering her subsequent motion of mention of hell, which means she claims Horatio consorted with the devil, and she disapproved of it. So Patricia Rochester believes her husband to be involved in the whole devil business. Matthew, let's see what he has let's see what he has to say about it. About this. Mr. Rochester, what can you tell us about your dealings with someone known as the devil? I can tell you nothing because I would label you as being mentally deranged. Did you label your wife Patricia as well? What do you know about Patricia? Is she the one who told you all this nonsense about me and the devil? Why, have we touched a nerve? Perhaps you weren't counting on us to learn quite so much. No, of course not. I'm just surprised at your gullibility. Patricia's been mad for years. You can't trust a word she says. Why, the woman used to do all sorts of loony things like burying her treasures in our yard like some crazed mole. Now it's time for my after supper nap. If you like, I can have the cook prepare some of the leftovers for you since you went to the trouble of coming out here for nothing. Well, Horatio was his usual abhorrent self. You're right, Matthew. He mentioned that Mrs. Rochester has had a habit of burying things. I wonder if she continued that practice at the asylum. Maybe there are some mementos from her past that will shed some more light on this devil. That's a brilliant idea, Matthew. Let's check in the asylum garden.
Patricia's notebook. Of course, earlier I played on the third crime scene in the kitchen, and I managed to get an extra 100,000 extra XP to put myself up to second place on that, on that crime scene. Unfortunately, third is the highest I can go with this capacity, but we'll see what happens. I can't send a card. Matthew, we actually found something buried here in the garden, and it belongs to Patricia Rochester. Let us see what we what she wrote inside this notebook. It appears there was a drawing, but it's been rubbed away. Let's recover it. Hmm. A devil sketch. Matthew, this drawing in Mrs. Rochester's notebook could give me nightmares. But you're right, the sketch clearly depicts the devil. Meanwhile, the building in the background appears to be the inn where we investigated the murder of Edgar Woe. So does this mean the devil stayed at the inn? Good idea, Matthew. Let's show the drawing to Mrs. Rochester. She told us she had trouble remembering anything about the devil, but maybe this will help. See what she has to say. Mrs. Rochester, we found this drawing you did of the devil. Does it refresh your memory? Yes, that's him. That's the devil. And there's his dark dwelling. The inn? Is this where we'll find him? Yes, he is the reigning overlord there. Overlord? You mean the innkeeper William Oland? Yes, that's the devil's name, Olin, the demon wretch. Oh, the weight of darkened eons is lifted from my shoulders. Finally, this evil will be dispelled. Tarnation! The innkeeper was right under our noses all along, and he sent us on this merry chase. Senior Trooper Matthew, the devil's days of taunting us are done. Let's go arrest Mr. Oland. William Oland, you're under arrest as an accomplice to murder. We know you're the devil. I'm the what? Senior Trooper Matthew, I've been called many things in my time, but never. We know you helped Annabelle Lee and Larry Rochester cover up murders they committed. We also received your taunting note, but now it's too late. We got, we've got you. If I were the devil, there's no way you measly police would be smart enough to catch me. Well, your identity was confirmed by the Rochesters. After all I've done for that family, one of them has given me away? All you've done for the Rochesters, what else have you helped them with? Oh, I'm no fool. You think I'll help you add to my list of crimes? It's bad enough you know this much. I had a jolly good run till you came here, fooling everyone with my devilry and having a laugh at their expense. So disguising murders as supernatural occurrences was just a game to you? You can call it a game if you like, but I've become a legend. People revere me, shudder to hear my name. There was also the money, of course. Well we've got on well we've got enough on you now to stop you. You're under arrest, and you won't be getting out for a long time. You can arrest me and take all my money, but good luck dealing with the Rochesters. You're fools if you think their crimes in Grim Chapel end with me. Matthew, it seems you've achieved everything we wanted to do today. Yes, I'm happy we helped Alice. A child doesn't belong in Gryphon Sanctuary. And the asylum director had better ensure he treats the patients better going forward. And we arrested the devil. The man behind the murders, disguised as supernatural events, turned out to be the local innkeeper, drunk on his power over people's imaginations. 
top-notch investigative work, Senior Trooper Matthew. Olin's case will go to trial soon. I feel another life sentence coming on. Olin did say some ominous things about the Rochesters having more to hide in Grim Chapel than their deal with the devil, though. We can't deny that family has some bad apples, but I'm sure Senior Trooper Matthew will root them out soon enough. But today marks a victory against them, to be sure. I think after this success, we deserve to treat ourselves as a night off. Well, I hear there's a carnival in town, if you're interested. Excellent! What do you say, Matthew? Let's go have some fun at the carnival. I do wish they included the food rewards with these like they did before, but I've been but I've learned to live with it so far. October 5th. And that's on Thursday again. rare ones. And I only get two of them. Four new stickers. Probably might have to do every single case in collection mode if I'm going to uh, complete an album. All right, case forty six. We are, in fact, we're only 15 cases away from finishing up this section. Or at least this season, anyway. But I will have more Elite Mode cases to do. As you can see, I have a total of 36 uh, rings. I've done a few cases in Collection Mode. But in the meantime, I'll be seeing you guys on October 5th.